Welcome to Newport Beach. Uh, very, very wonderful location. It's not often that we have a, uh, a seminar across the street from an open Ferrari dealership. <laughs> of course, I did notice some vacant space right next to it, so I don't know what happened there, but uh, things are pretty, pretty good here in Newport, and this is certainly a, uh, a lovely location. Um, the Mises Institute goes way back uh, here in Newport. In fact, uh, even at the uh, Balboa Bay Club, February in 2001, we had a conference. In fact, we had the last conference that was held at the old Balboa Bay, Club, Balboa Bay Club before it was renovated into this, uh, into this um, facility. So we go way back. And uh, our last Mesa Circle was uh, held in Costa Mesa. And uh, the sponsor for that, uh, for that event is the same sponsor that we have today. Um, the way to have one of these events is we need a sponsor, need somebody to write a check, and uh, a lot of people talk about doing Mesa Circles, not many people write checks, uh, but uh, Lou Carabini is today's sponsor uh, who has uh, stepped up. He's the founder of Monex, America's premier precious metals dealer since 1967, so please Help me thank Mr. Lou Carabini. <laughs> By the way, he's a man of many talents. You may have noticed that he, the, he is the author of the book that uh, uh, was on the chair as you came in, Inclined to Liberty. So he is not only a successful entrepreneur, but he is a writer and a thinker. And in fact, I would uh, direct you to the Mises um, website where he wrote an article for the Journal of Libertarian Studies that we just posted. Uh, had an article entitled Bastiat, Bastiat's The Broken Window, A Critique. So, and he also cooks a wonderful dinner. So he is not just a pretty face. Mr. Luke Carabini is indeed a Renaissance man. So we thank him. Uh, for his sponsorship, and uh, he is very much a, uh, a friend of the Institute. Now, when we have these events, I assume most people know about the, um, the Ludwig von Mises Institute, but it occurs to me that occasionally people get drugged here against their will. It's a Saturday afternoon. Honey, this would be a great thing to do. Uh, why go to the beach? Why to go to the football game? when we could go hear some great economics. And uh, so for those who don't know who we are, we were started in 1982 by Lou Rockwell, who started the Institute with his typewriter and his checkbook, as he describes. But now we are the, uh, the world leader in providing educational materials about the Austrian School of Economics, classical liberalism, and libertarian political theory. Of course, this movement's blossomed into massive international movements, students, professors, professionals, people of all walks of life. And of course, coming here today, you are now part of that international movement. So thank you. We have a number of scholarship students here today, and I would like them to stand. Please. Yeah. Whenever we have uh, institute events, we offer scholarships to students, and, uh, and for those who are members and supporters, you make that all happen. You'll notice there are some membership cards uh, available to you if you wanna join us in uh, uh, what we do and the work that we do. And if you sign up with us today, you get a special inducement to do that. It's called Reassessing the Presidency, a wonderful book. We actually have, uh, it's, we have a number of authors who contributed to this book, and uh, one of them is here today, today. He not only wrote one essay, but he wrote two essays, as he's told me over and over again. So if you ask him to sign this, ask him to sign it twice, 
that will no doubt annoy him and make me happy. But again, uh, membership cards are here. Please think about uh, uh, joining us uh, as a member of uh, the Mises Institute. We're not funded by any large foundations. Uh, it's people just like you, people like Lou Carabini and a number of other um, great contributors that we have in the, off, uh, in the uh, crowd today. Um, James Fogel is here. He's, uh, he's at the back. And uh, he's our director of development. And if you're interested in disinheriting Uncle Sam or anything like that, not that any of you would want to do that, but uh, if you have questions about that, James is here uh, to talk about some of that financial planning sorts of things. Also, we're asked at these events to have a sign-up sheet. People come to these events, they meet other people that think like they do, talk like they do, and they want to get in touch with them later. And uh, we have created a sign-up sheet for that purpose. If you don't want to be contacted, don't want to be a part of this, want to be an individualist, want to go it alone, it's great. We're all for you. Don't put your name on the list. But if you do want to um, connect with some people who've been here, we have a sign-up sheet right out front, um, right out with, uh, with Christy Holmes. So please take advantage of that if, uh, if that interests you. So that's pretty much the, uh, the welcome that I have. And I put myself first on the program, not just to get it out of the way, but I have such an uplifting talk today about debt and despair that I thought I would get the, uh, I would set the tone for today's conference. So. In his book, The Causes of, of uh, Economic Crisis, Ludwig von Mises explained that easy money or the result of politically lowered interest rates succeeds in bringing about a booming business. But that this prosperity is artificial, that it cannot last, and it must lead ultimately to a slump. Now we've heard this before, anybody who's familiar with the Austrian business cycle is aware that first entrepreneurs borrow at these reduced rates and the entrepreneur assumes that the cost structure for the project will remain the same as it was before the, uh, the credit expansion. But as credit is expanded, factors of production are bid to higher and higher prices. Wages go up, material prices go up, and the entrepreneur just keeps borrowing because the banks are, are eager to lend the easy money. And that's what we've seen through the past few years. Prices and wage rates continue to boom, wrote Mises. Everyone feels happy and is convinced that now finally mankind has overcome forever the gloomy state of scarcity and reached everlasting prosperity, unquote. Well, Mises explained that, in fact, all of this amazing wealth is really quite fragile. It's a castle built on sands of illusion and that it cannot last. There is no means to substitute banknotes and deposits for non-existent capital goods. The artificial boom brought about by cheap money creates the illusion that certain projects will be profitable for entrepreneurs, and in turn the jobs created will be secure. We often talk about these investors who, who invest with cheap money during the boom. They invest in this money is uh, turned into malinvestments. Ultimately, the malinvestments are revealed. The values drop. The debt still remains. And of course, the entrepreneur goes and broke. But as the investor, entrepreneur, and businessman are fooled by the low interest rates and the potential for profit, so is the average wage earner. Not only is capital misdirected into malinvestments during the boom, but labor and consumer confidence is misdirected as well. How many people quit their jobs to day trade during the stock boom in the 1990s? How many people went to work selling real estate during the boom? In Las Vegas, where I spent uh, 22 years, at the height of the boom, one in every 100 people in Vegas had a real estate license. 
How many people have been lured into the financial services industry? Money management firms still report that they're receiving the same number of applications for entry-level jobs, even though we've had a big, huge bust in that industry. But the financial sector was 45% of the earnings of the S&P 500 back in 2006. So motivated college students are just, were just following the money. That's how they've uh, directed their studies, and those are the jobs that they're pursuing. But much of the earnings by those financial firms was the debt that was paid not only by corporations and business, but individuals as well, many of whom worked in that same financial industry, an industry that with the help of government creates this illusion, this illusion of wealth and prosperity that Mises spoke about. And as employees believe this illusion illusory prosperity will last forever, they take on debt because getting the money is easy during a boom. This fiat inflation gives individuals the opportunity to borrow. Professor Guido Holzman writes, the mere fact that such credit is offered at all incites some people to go into debt who would otherwise have chosen not to do so. But easy credit becomes nearly irresistible in connection with another typical comp consequence of inflation, namely the constantly rising price level. Back in 1980, the head of Bank of America's credit card division, Kenneth Larkin, gave a speech quoting two USC scholars. These scholars believe that people born between 1956 and 1975 would have completely different values such as, number one, it doesn't pay to save for a rainy day. Number two, buy now, not later. Prices will invariably go up, and the purchasing power of your dollar will invariably go down. Number three, stretch your financial obligations over as long a period of time as possible. Number four, borrowing improves your credit rating. Number five, pay your bills as late as you can without jeopardizing your credit rating. Now these truly are the lessons of inflation. Joseph uh, Nosura uh, wrote that in a, in a great book about the credit card industry called A Piece of the Action. So it's, if in the early decades of the century it was impossible for a working man or a woman to secure a loan from a legitimate lender, in the 80s, he or she could hardly refuse one. Jim Grant wrote, the descendants of the clientele of the loan sharks became the valued credit members of leading banks. In the 1980s, the home equity loan proliferated, personal bankruptcy lost its stigma. As credit card executive John Decker explained, to make credit card lending profitable, you find people who get into debt, stay in debt, and always pay the minimum balance on time. So household debt reached $13.8 trillion in 2007, with $10.5 trillion of that being mortgage debt. The leading edge of the baby boomers turned 30 years of age in the late 1970s, just as the usage of debt became began to accelerate. Debt took off like a rocket ship after 9-11, with the president urging Americans to spend, and then Fed Chair Alan Greenspan lowering interest rates to 1%. Imagine a low Fed funds rate like 1%. See, we have a Fed funds rate of, uh, what, a quarter percent or less now. At the time, Dallas Fed Governor Robert McTeer told uh, the Chamber of Commerce in Richardson, Texas, if we all go out and just join hands and buy an SUV, everything will be all right. <laughs> Preferably a navigator. And at the time, uh, Bill Bonner and Addison Wigan wrote, thrift can, uh, came to be seen as an enemy of the state, almost as diabolical as Osama bin Laden. Later, McTeer commented that Americans have been doing something that's probably irrational from the point of view of the individual consumer. 
because they all need to be saving more, saving for retirement, saving for college and all that, but we'd be in bad trouble if they started doing the rational thing all of a sudden. We're happy they're spending. We wish that they didn't run up a lot of debt doing it, unquote. But the problem was it's that the money supply has grown 100, since 1980 has grown 460%. Meantime, the median family income has barely budged. So running up the debt has been the only way for patriotic Americans to keep on spending. Personal savings rate fell from 11% in 1980 to a negative 1% in 2007. Of course, it's rebounded into positive territory, which has analysts on the TV fretting about Keynes's paradox of thrift and and nonsense like that. But in the wake of 9-11, consumer confidence was supremely confident. That fall, consumer confidence took its biggest jump in more than a decade. Consumers kept buying and buying on credit. And for the credit card companies, uh, they put the power of, of plastic in most everybody's hands. But for those who didn't have a credit card, well, the payday loan business was there for them. Now, I don't know if anybody in the room frequents payday loan lenders. Um, I'm going to assume not many. But this is kind of the way it works. If you want to borrow 400 bucks for two weeks because your car breaks down, you would write the payday lender a check for $460. A post-dated check for the day you get paid. When the two weeks rolls around, if you want to pay the loan off, then they would cash the check, and you paid 60 bucks on the 400, which is an annual percentage rate of a smooth 390%. Now, if you can't pay it off, you would flip the loan. You would uh, write a new check uh, for another 460, uh, or you would, you would give the uh, lender $60 uh, write a new check for 460 and start this all over again. Of course, states weigh in on this. Uh, states, uh, state governments, local governments hate payday lenders. And so uh, they're subject to numerous laws that are growing every day. But um, most payday lenders um, have somewhere between, a, you know, the 390% rate that I mentioned or a 650% annual percentage rate in some cases. And plenty of people are going to payday lenders. According to the Dallas Morning News, 2008, the U.S.'s largest payday lender, Advanced America, made $4.2 billion in payday loans. And they charge $676 million in interest and fees. Cash America, a pawn shop, Operator and payday lender based in Fort Worth recorded income of 81 million last year, um, income that's grown 132% in the last four years, total revenue of 1.3 billion. So plenty of people are going to payday loans to try to catch up. But as I said, local politicians uh, hate these payday lenders, but they don't realize that the real villain here is the inflation making. Federal Reserve. But really, the largest source of debt is mortgage debt for home purchases. Till recently, home ownership was only a dream for most Americans. From 1900 to 1940, fewer than half of all Americans owned their homes. Home ownership rates, in fact, fell in the first three of, three of the first four decades of the 20th century. Whereas young people today, they have a job, halfway stable source of income, they're immediately going to take out a mortgage and go buy. Their great-grandfather might still have accumulated savings for 30 years and then bought his house. But today, two-thirds of Americans own their home uh, because, as Thomas Segrew says, we are a nation of homeowners and home speculators because of Uncle Sam. For 1929, the government paid very little role in the housing market other than mortgage interest being made tax deductible in the 1913 federal tax code. In fact, having a mortgage was a case for stigma. Mortgages were hard to come by with lenders. Uh, lenders wanted 50% down. Um, 
And on top of that, the interest rates were high and the term of these loans were very, uh, were very short. They were only three to five years. So there were typically only two types of homeowners at the time, the wealthy who paid cash and working folks who built their own homes. As uh, Segru pointed out, even the richest rented because they had better places to invest than the volatile housing market. But that all changed with the Depression, as a lot of things changed with the Depression. New housing starts had fallen, and Ho uh, Herbert Hoover, um, contrary to what you may read, he didn't sit idly by. He signed the Federal Home Loan Bank Act in 1932, and uh, it was the first of many interventions in the housing market. In his first 100 days, FDR introduced the Homeowners Loan Act, which would extend relief to homeowners who couldn't pay their mortgages. A thousand urban mortgages a day were being foreclosed on. So he wrote a bill that uh, lowered interest rates and lengthened repayment schedules to help out foreclosed homeowners. Of course, we see, see this happening again. Um, Fannie Mae has just announced that if you can't make your payments, uh, you can do a sale lease back with them. They'll take, um, they'll take ownership of the home and you can pay them rent and stay there. Um, we see various uh, programs that are very much the same. Now this uh, Homeowners Loan Act actually was, was geared for poor and middle class homeowners. Uh, the top loan uh, was only $20,000, but uh, that's the equivalent of 317,000 today. So it did capture, uh, it captured a number of, uh, of homeowners at the time. But then four years later, the big creation uh, was made and that was the uh, Fannie Mae, Federal National Mortgage Association. It created a secondary market for mortgages and it was given the mandate to help make home ownership more available throughout the United States. Now these programs boosted home ownership in a hurry. 1950, 55% of people own their own home. By 1970, home ownership was 63%. But beginning in 1992, Congress pushed Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, to increase their purchases of mortgages to low and moderate income borrowers. For 1996, the Department of Housing and Urban Development gave Fannie and Freddie an explicit target. 42% of their mortgage financing had to go to borrowers with income below the median for their area. That target increased in, to 50% in 2000 and 52% in 2005. Then Fannie Mae launched its American Dream in 2000, American Dream Commitment. That was to provide $2 trillion private capital for 18 million underserved Americans to own or rent a home by the end of the decade. In 04, Fannie expanded the American dream, pledging to help six million families become first time home, homeowners over the next decade. Well, what this is is really a social engineering experiment. Because the thought at the time was one, in fact, one survey said that consumer finances found that Low-income homeowners had a net worth 12 times that of renters at the same income level. Other studies found that children of homeowners are more likely to graduate from high school and college, and they are more likely to go on and own a home of their own. Also, there was research that showed that home ownership keeps communities attractive, safe, and vital, generating higher property values and other economic activity. So voila, we need to make everybody a homeowner, and then everything will work out better. This is like the studies that show that college graduates make more money. So we need to make everybody a college graduate. So they'll make more money. Well, of course, not everybody can be a college graduate. Not everybody can be a homeowner. But President Bush did his part. December 16th, 2003, he signed a law, the American Dream Down Payment Act. 2003, help approximately 40,000 families a year with their down payment and further strengthen America's housing market is what they said. It complemented the president's aggressive housing agenda announced to dismantle the barriers to home ownership. And putting down payment down was, uh, 
well, it was a uh, it was a barrier. So the Bush administration said at the time, the strong housing market is beneficial for communities across the nation. So the whole down payment idea was very much passe, and because of that, from 1997 to 2005, the average price of a home in the United States doubled. And with this doubling, the subprime mortgage market was born and nurtured. Fannie and Freddie played a significant role in the explosion of subprime mortgages and subprime mortgage-backed securities. Without the implicit government guarantee of the GSEs, it's unlikely that the subprime market would have taken off. Home ownership jumped from 64% jumped from in 1994 to 69% in 2004. And the result of the increase, uh, because of the increased loans to low income, high risk borrowers. Both Bill Clinton and George Bush trumpeted the rise in ownership as it occurred. Well, what's the result of all this? According to a new report from uh, First American Logic, nearly a third of all mortgages are now underwater. Of course, by underwater we mean the amount of the mortgage is more than the amount of the value of the home. A new Deutsche Bank report predicts that by 2011, 48% of all mortgaged Americans will be underwater. But underwater is no problem for Fannie and Freddie. In July, the two GSEs received regulatory approval to refinance mortgages at loan-to-value ratios as high as 125%. Remember when Alan Greenspan said, go out and get that adjustable rate mortgage? Well, now the government has, in the words of Grant's interest rate observer, blessed, subsidized, and institutionalized the state of underwater home ownership. But the GSEs, GSEs can modify all they want. Doesn't mean that distressed homeowners can or will pay. According to Mortgage Metrics Report, published uh, by the Comptroller of the Currency and the Office of Thrift Super Supervision, 28% of all modified loans were 60 percent or were 60 days delinquent within 60 days of their modification. Now what that means is that more than one in four people who modify their loans because they can't pay under the original terms don't make a single payment after they modify. And as analyst David uh, Rosenberg explains, now that lenders have started to respond to their record high delinquency rates by rationing credit, a mad scramble for cash is occurring to replace loans. Food stamp usage is up 22% year over year. Pawn shop business is up nearly 40%. And there's a tidal wave of applications for Social Security disability benefits that were not explained alone by workplace mishaps. It's the lost generation, Business Week says. Unemployment nationwide is now 10.2%, but for young people it's 18%. And for those of you who follow John Williams' shadowstats.com, his, um, his alternative unemployment rate is 22%. Now, John Williams tracks unemployment the way unemployment used to be tracked before the Clinton years, where they changed the way some, some people were counted. So John Williams may yet have the most accurate measure of unemployment. Foreclosure crisis uh, affected nearly... 938,000 properties in the last quarter. That was up from 890 properties the prior three months. That puts us on a uh, rate to hit 3.5 million foreclosures this year, up from 2.3 million foreclosures last year. Personal bankruptcies rose steadily um, from 300,000 per year in the early 1980s to peak at over 2 million in 2005. The reason they peaked in 05, bankruptcy change, were, laws were changed in 06, but now we're starting to see more and more uh, bankruptcies. In fact, over a million people filed for personal bankruptcy in 08. That number has already been surpassed through the first nine months of this year. Now, as Hans Hermann Hoppe pointed out in his uh, his wonderful book, Democracy, the God That Failed, 
It is savers that initiate the process of civilization. By generating a tendency toward a fall in time preference, he and those that exchange with him, quote, matures from childhood to adulthood and from barbarism to civilization. Well, instead, what we have now is the reverse. The debt accumulation of government, business, and individuals reverses progress and is leading to barbarism. Professor Holzman explains, the net effect of the recent surge in household debt is therefore to throw entire populations into financial dependency. The moral implications are clear. Towering debts are incompatible with financial self-reliance, and thus they tend to weaken self-reliance also in all other spheres. The debt-ridden individual eventually adopts the habit of turning to others for help rather than maturing into an economic and moral anchor of his family and of his wider community. Wishful thinking and submissiveness replace soberness and independent judgment. And what about the many cases in which families can no longer shoulder the debt load? Then the result is either despair or alternatively scorn for all standards of financial sanity. The constant creation of fiat money, instead of encouraging savings and thrift, has created personal fiscal insolvency on a massive scale. And this fiscal insolvency now threatens to lead this country and the entire world to moral insolvency. <laughs>